Blockchain Show is a podcast that demystifies cryptocurrencies and distributed ledger technology. Hello, welcome back. You're listening to The Blockchain Show. I'm your host, Ethan Kinderconnect. And today I'm here with Daryl Taylor and Russ Lima, the guys from Envision. Gentlemen, welcome to The Blockchain Show. Awesome. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks for being with me today. First, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to learn about the blockchain. Hello, everyone. My name is Daryl. Uh, my background before getting into the blockchain cryptocurrency space, uh, I was in direct marketing, the direct selling industry, uh, focused a lot of my attention working for a company that you know was more on the energy retailing side. And when I discovered how renewable energy was going to be, you know, probably the, I guess, say more higher in demand. At that same time, we all heard about Bitcoin in the 2017 bull run that happened. And I actually started getting involved on the trading and arbitrage side in 2018 when the dip happened. And when I saw how much people were valuing the blockchain technology itself, not so much really the cryptocurrency, but where this technology could go. Same time, I met my partner, uh, Russell Lima. We talked about how this was going to be in demand as, you know, data, obviously data security, compliance and audit tracking for that matter. Like all of that is what we saw was going to be more higher in demand. And ever since then, we formed Envision, even though before we were two complete strangers. Now, here we are addressing the UN. And from there, you know, with our partnerships and we're ready to go to 2021 and beyond. Hi, folks. I'm Russ Lima, um, co-founder of Envision. Um, I started in crypto back when you could still mine BTC using a CPU. Um, so it's been a while. Um, mostly on the mining side, not really trading, not really sending, participating in a few ICOs here and there on the purchasing side. Um, and what you know, as I watched blockchain develop, I watched a lot of people not really focusing and harnessing the technology as much and producing something, but, you know, more focused on the currency and the making money of it, which I didn't think was the right way to go. <clears throat> when I met Daryl, you know, I, um, I have a background in IT, identity management. We started talking about, you know, what the blockchain is used for and how, you know, compliance and things are a big deal and how, you know, this really could be utilized with tracking and automated tracking and automated uh, compliance storage for audits. You know, as an IT guy, I know that you can go in the back end of any application and change the data anytime you want. Somebody can. But if we store it on the blockchain, it won't get changed. And that's kind of how we formed our application Delta and Envision was born and we decided to get into this. Awesome. I had maybe a handful of, of other folks trying to do something to help the environment through blockchain and different ways to go about it, but never really um, talked about waste tracking um, using blockchain technology. So maybe uh, just give us a little bit more of a, a dive into um, what your vision is there. I see it honestly more. It's like, if yeah, I'm pretty sure everyone's heard, you know, there's there's controversial topics like climate change, you know, and then there's global warming. There, there's a lot of those topics that, that arise. But when you go to the root, and this is what I talked about at the UN, is addressing really the root of this cause, which is, are really these companies complying with how they deal with their waste management services and their sanitation department? And that's a big, big, big issue when it comes to as far as any stability and anything else regarding the, you know, helping the environment. And we all say reduce, reuse, recycle. But unfortunately, a lot of those products actually aren't recycled in the way we thought it would be. And most of the time, and, Ru and Russ could, pro could probably talk more about the technicality because he's worked more, and more on that end. But what I see is that the schools I went to, a lot of it was built on those landfills, which really doesn't do as much. And so this helps with the compliance and security side more versus and that's where the blockchain the blockchain comes in instead of it being so much analog it's there forever but it keeps the accountability and a good check and balance system yeah we basically what we've come to realize is that there's it's a semi-manual to a manual process nowadays for tracking of trash so we thought about that and I thought about automating that, which increases efficiency and reduces emissions. You know, if you have more, the more data you have, the more you, I could tell this house produces 50 pounds of trash a week. That house only produces 20. Maybe we don't need three trucks going in this neighborhood based on the averages. Right. And they, they always just use three trucks because it made it quick. 
And then you start looking at, okay, we started looking at, well, what's being used for the trash? And that's when we found our partner, CETS, and whose vision is to create a zero-waste world, really. And they have technology. We've advanced far enough where you can actually take all of the waste feeds, including sewage, and you could process them in these processing centers that they have and produce nothing but usable byproducts, clean water, power, fertilizer with the carbons. Um, they contain all the gases that can be reused in chemical plants, and then you have plastics and metals that can be later recycled and reused to manufacture things. And we looked at this closed-loop system, and they were asking about, you know, how do we, how do we show the value? You know, how do we track track what we're doing and so people see actually what we're processing and how much we're reducing and that's where we came in we're like well we can that's what we're designing is waste tracking and it just was an immediate partnership and we hit it off and that's as daryl mentioned that's how we ended up at the united nations and that's how we ended up we're going back again in june um, to present a tabletop model of the waste systems so you know that's really what we're envisioning is taking the token and putting it to help the world you know we only need a little bit of funds to actually make the app but the rest of the funds can go to helping the world and that's really what our envision is about very innovative i never thought you could use the blockchain for something like this. I mean, it's it, it's not very glamorous at, at the first glance, but the more I kind of dig into to this topic, it's incredibly useful. And, you know, it, it will be something that could be glamorous if people take notice. I mean, uh, the effects that is. So uh, we've got the blockchain uh, to have kind of like a public assurance mechanism there. Tell me about the, the modality through the Envision token. How is that utilizing smart contracts? And, and maybe just give us a little bit of an overview on how all that works. Basically, what we did was we decided to come out with a token to let people get involved with purchasing a token and having that they know it's going to help the environment, right? It, it gives people power. You know, um, We're going to do live feeds so people can see it. Now, as far as the technical aspect, what we've done is we've taken the token and we're assigning wallet addresses across an infrastructure of waste management, right? Whether it's a closed loop system, um, only mute, moving a few feet, or whether it's a whole neighborhood, um, each stop will have a, a wallet address. And we're utilizing the token as a vehicle, so to speak, to track the actual waste shipments, whatever, if it's a can of trash or a trash truck, and then taking measurements at every single IoT device or every single stop, it will measure how much the trash truck weighs or how much trash is there, temperature, mass, chemical compounds, whatever the sensors are picking up. And then it will generate a smart contract and a uh, encryption number. And that encrypted data can never be changed from that point on. And you can literally watch a token move from origin origin point all the way through until its final resting place. And you know that's exactly where the waste went. And as these IoT devices pick up, you know, you should never see like a sand truck leaving an oil field come back, uh, end up at the dump half the weight that it was when it left the oil field. You know, it's like, oh, okay, somebody did something to not pay that fee. Or, you know, you can just do stuff like that with it. So you actually watch the transverse of the coin across individuals' infrastructures uh, through IoT. Yeah, very good. There has to be so much uh, waste within the waste management industry. You know, um, like you mentioned, using multiple trucks when it's not needed. I'm sure there's a lot of fuel getting wasted. You know, it just seems like such a, a perfect area to get disrupted that, again, I don't think many people were looking into. And it kind of reminds me of the the construction um industry for a while. I was working there out of high school and one of the, um, uh, he was higher up than a foreman. I can't remember his title, but he would tell me that there's not much profit in the construction industry. A lot of it is just spent on materials and the like. And I remember thinking back then, this was over you know, a decade ago, like we need, they need better technology. They need something to really streamline this process because there could be a lot more profitability if they could just, because you think about the huge monstrous machines that they're moving around and people are trying to work their, their enough hours and is everything necessary and it's, it's there's just so much and when i look at say uh in the los angeles area where i live the there's, there's i think there's several waste management companies one's through the city one's more private but i mean it's just a huge undertaking to get all this this garbage out of people's homes and to the dump we don't really know i've been to the dump a few times and it's just it's just a nightmare, man. It's it's so sad. Yeah, the litter box. 
<laughs> the litter box were. Yeah. So I guess kind of what, what I'm hinting at here is how is this going to be uh, disruptive in the financial sense? Um, are, we, are we talking about decentralized finance? Is this, is this something that uh, waste companies can utilize? How does it tie into the, to the people on the ground, the, uh, the logistics of the operation and, and maybe um, just kind of how that would work going forward? Yeah. Um, basically what the tracking and the audit compliance will do, it'll help with, you know, at, at the back end for the office services, you know, where how much com- you could pick any point and what was produced here on this day and where did it go? Um, now, for the people on the ground, what it really means is um, what the application will do. It'll help make their job more efficient and automated. There's no more handwriting logbooks and things like that when you're coming in and out of the dump. Um, if you go to the dump at all, the idea is that when, with our partner CETS is that there won't be any more. It's all automated systems, automatically done, and there would be no waste at the end of the process. But until that happens, um, and for other waste management systems, what you do is you make the whole process more efficient for them and also automate a lot of it, like how much was in there. You don't have to stop at the waste stations because it's automatically censored on the trucks um, and just make the whole process more efficient and streamlined, like you're saying. And then at the end of the day, you know, we could bring in our partner's technology and start processing the dumps and actually reverse the damage we've done by processing the trash. Um, at the end of the day, it's a huge disruption on waste facilities and even sewage because they can they can process that. From the DeFi aspect of it is that we're we're not finance, but we're harnessing the the culture of DeFi, which is basically remove the human element and the error possibilities, automate the processes. You don't need somebody to enter in a manual transaction anymore on a computer desk just because. You can automate that with contracts and. Um, applications. And that's really what DeFi is, is automating the process. That's what we're looking to do is automate this manual process, get people out of it as much as possible, and then have it recorded in a way that can't be changed to hold everybody accountable for what's really going on. I see. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I was curious about uh, carbon tax because it's something we used to hear a lot more about, uh, particularly in the last presidential administration. At this time, everything's kind of up in the air. We don't, I don't really know what's going on. I don't really want to know sometimes, to be honest, uh, it, it, it was a, something that was a little bit divisive for some people. So uh, what's your view on um, that whole carbon tax system that is, I don't even know if it's in place right now, but or, or in development and, and how, how do you think that can be kind of streamlined towards more like a reward system for recycling? Honestly, for a, on the tokenomic side, I'm kind of with you as far as the political aspect of this because you know everything is up up in the air and it's you know a lot of drama here and there. But on the token aspect side, like my partner mentioned, is people have a chance here. But you're you're buying a token, but at the same time you're getting involved. And when you talk about like environment being environmental, very eco friendly, climate change, all this stuff, and that goes into the other the carbon credits, carbon tax. The sad part is that it did cause a lot of division, and that's where. For me personally, when I saw when I saw this idea and I talked about it with my partner, we didn't want any of this type of division, you know, any type of you know, just drama that can that can, that can affect a society in a bad way. We're trying to do a good thing here, and the only way to do that is to keep a level playing field on something new, but something better. And that's really the only that's really the, where the envision token comes in to either, you know, look at, look at cryptos, for instance, you know, you have staking rewards that you can get involved in where people, if they hold the token, then that comes in. Same time, all funding, you know, myself, Russ, alongside our whole original architecture team, none of the funding goes to us. We give it all to the projects because the problem is that, you know, there's not really any clarity, at least from my end on what I see, no matter how far in deep I go to look at either any of these waste management facilities and what they're actually doing. And so if there's money going in there, there's trash going in there, but we don't really know what's going on or who's being honest. At least like for us, we're that one private company that's actually at least showing what we're doing and not just talking talk, but we're walking the walk. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's very good to hear there. I think you're, you're spot on, right? In, in many ways. Um, you, sometimes in the political theater, the intention can get lost, you know, and, and I think you're right. It's trying to do good for... Um, not only the planet, but the people living on it. So no, I was just gonna say, you know, there, there, there's people, and and I know that uh, Russ. I think when you told me when you talked about work, working back in construction, but 
it's for me, I've been to the re- a recent recycling facility. And when I take a look, I'm not sure if you've seen that show Wally or the, the movie. And it's like, when you see, when you see like literally those actual, there's real like trucks that are actually compressing all this trash. But then, you know, there was a church that was out in East Houston and I see these huge landfills that are like the size of literally like mansions. And you're, and, and you're looking at this and I'm like, well, why is our money going here when I just have a conversation? I got guys that actually are geologists, guys that actually know that are engineers that know how to process it, that have the background to do it, but are willing to do it. Because there's a lot of people that are all bark, but no bite. But now when people, I mean, the way you look at it from a disruptive phase, cryptocurrency, blockchain, as far as the integrity side, it's a check mark. Environmentally friendly, it's a check mark. You look at also providing, because these byproducts are usable too. That means that revenue comes in. Now what we're talking about here also is jobs, check marks, so all everything else that, you know, everyone's been stressing about, we're, tr- we're trying to help society. You know, people say, solution. I'm just trying to help, man. No, that's awesome. I, I, I have a quick story about uh, my landfill experience in, uh, as a kid. A uh, close friend of the family worked at the landfill and he would always kind of give me the inside scoop when the Walmart truck was going to come into town. I grew up in, uh, in the Midwest. And one time he said, hey, it's the electronic truck. That, so I went out and man, I got a new Wi-Fi router, video game controllers, like all this stuff that was fine that they were just throwing out and I couldn't believe it. And um. I was a little embarrassed to tell my friends like, yeah, I got this from the dump, but I mean, I used that router for like 10 years almost. And it, it's just crazy to me how, how that company would just come and just throw it away, write it off or, you know, or it's a loss. I just, even back then, I remember thinking this is not, it's, it's wrong, but it's kind of, it's, it, it works for me because I'm getting some stuff. And, and there were people who would, you know, go to the dump just to pick stuff up, <laughs> like scavenger type folks who would just go with enough stuff and you, you pay the fee to get in and, you know, take other people's junk and get out. And I remember thinking, man, that's, that's weird. But you know, the saying, uh, another, one man's trash, another man's treasure. So funny. You, funny. You said. <laughs> yeah. It's all about, <laughs> go ahead, Russ. it's really all about the fact that the world right now is in a linear economy. You know, we're trying to recycle, but we're only about 5% recycling about anything. Right. We, we pick it up, we use it, we throw it away and we forget. And, you know, that's the way we're all right now. What we need to start thinking about more is the circular economy where you take it, you use it, you put it in a place that can break it down to its barest things, reprocess it, and then reapply that to building something else. And then instead of having all this trash we're just throwing away or ending up in the oceans, you now are building as much as you can out of what you've already mined, what you've already built, what you already have sitting around. And that's the mentality instead of, you know, like back in the day, they used to replace tubes on a TV when the TV broke. Nowadays, you just go get a new TV. It's not even worth it. Just throw that one away. Well, that's going to have to change somewhere in the line. And the only way it's going to change at this moment, at this time, is that you hit it where people are throwing the stuff away and take as much out of that as possible. And that's really who we're partnering with now, the projects we're looking at, is who can use any of this trash to do anything with it? You know, waste to renewable energy, we can do that, which really helps the blockchain community because everybody talks about power use on the blockchain, mining, how much power, how much coal, how much CO2, you know, Bitcoin produces just mining Bitcoin. Well, our our systems that we partner with are going to generate power, at least one of them. And then how else we can leverage that and just reduce that waste to the barest minimum possible. Yeah, man, that, that is what we need. That really is good to hear. Um, and now I think that I didn't even mention the name of the token, but it's just Envision. Envision, ticker NVZN. Got it. Okay. We kind of talked a little bit about energy. The decentralization of energy is something that's been on my mind uh, of late because I never really thought about centralized energy being a problem, but it kind of is a big, it is a problem for a lot of people. I know that uh, Southern California Edison here has something called the Clean Power Alliance where they allegedly buy clean electricity. You can can, uh, select some of that for your 
electrical plan. They tell you you're getting this amount of credits. You just have to believe them. There's no real transparency that I can find that I look into it. Um, I know that there's been some scandal in other uh, energy companies throughout the country about is it actually clean or not? And can you can you buy these credits legitimately? I'm just kind of curious how um, the, uh, the Envision token might become a kind of a catalyst towards this decentralization of of energy. Well, um, our partner, what's going on with them is that they're having us handle the front of the house, so to speak. So as you process the waste coming in, then the byproducts of all that waste on what it turns into, one of which is power. They've partnered with a, a another company that is going to be one of these brokers, one of these brokers that are you know, taking the credits and taking the power um, credits of the green energy power and then brokering those out to places. Because basically, the like Edison's deal, what you're talking about, is they look at how many people signed up in their plan. Okay, I need to buy so many kilowatts or megawatts of green power. Then they go to these green energy plants and buy that. And hopefully it's a one-to-one ratio and it cancels out. You know, we bought this many green energy. It's just like carbon credits. And that's the way it functions now. So that's going to be handled outside of the account and, um, or outside of the Envision scope because we want to focus mainly on compliance and tracking because that's our biggest thing is the compliance, the audits. You know, when, a, when an auditing company comes and, or the EPA comes, how much trash did you really process from all these locations? Here's a report. I can guarantee that never been touched, never been changed. That's exactly how much was done that day. Yeah, that's that's one of my really uh you touched on one of my favorite aspects of just blockchain tech in general is how different projects can work together. And there's always something I'm amazed. Like I did not even think that was possible. But when you combine forces, it really is just a force multiplier, bringing forth the cyclical economy that that you mentioned earlier. Adding value to what we throw away is something that needs to happen because I, I think that we're just you're right, we're so used to just put it out on the curb, it's gone, it's out of my life, I don't have to worry about it. But yet there's a huge patch of plastic floating in the ocean and there's, you know, batteries leaking acid in, into the ground and all this this horrible stuff. What do you think it's going to take not only to to kind of make this shift in people's mindsets? The question is, what are some of the, um, the uh, thought processes that you guys have gone through to kind of try to help incentivize this the shift to more of a cyclical economy and, and people going forward? For me, at least. Um, I don't know about you, Daryl, but what I look at is this year was a reset year for a lot of people. And you got to see a lot of things that people hadn't seen before. You know, uh, Venice aqueducts clear, dolphins swimming in Venice. Um, the skies were clear when everybody was on lockdown. You know, a whole bunch of change happened. And people took notice to that. They took real notice to, oh, when we're not doing so much crap, the world kind of gets better. And so the incentivization of trash and, you know, governments are already committing to this. They've been talking about it for 50 years. The action has to come from people in the private sector to bring forward and say, hey, I have this solution. We're going to implement it so you all can watch and then get on board. And um, our partner, CETS Technologies, has really done that. They've already signed up three municipalities. And I think once you get one, all it takes is one to see. And you go, oh, my God, this is what's going on. You can actually do that. And then every, there's no reason. You have to find an excuse not to do it, right? If something's so good and so helpful, and then why not do it? If it doesn't change the current process. And I think that's the thing is for the end people, don't change their process. They don't have to even worry about it because people don't want to worry. You change it on the back end, and then people will be wanting to adapt that once they see it's out there. Mm. Yeah. I think you're right. That's that's a really good point. Uh, one of my, uh, sorry for another quick story here, but my first jobs moving to LA was a door-to-door solar salesman. And I ended up getting a lot of hatred from people, for, obviously for interrupting their daily routines. But one time, um, you know, every once in a while, you, I would have good conversations with people. And it was amazing to see the differences in energy uses house to house, because sometimes they would pull out their bill, share like, oh yeah, this is what I'm spending on electricity. It's crazy. And then another, the house right next door would have virtually nothing. And I would, and uh, it was, uh, I think, uh, uh, I don't remember what part of Asia this couple was from, they're elderly folks. They shared with me their bills and it was like, I couldn't believe how little their bill was. And I said, I, how are you doing this? It wasn't a sale, obviously, but we just had a good chat. And they're like, yeah, we're, we're very careful with our electricity. We, we use the same 
they because this was a DWP uh, a bill, so that we had water, power, trash, electricity, or in there, right? yeah. And they're like, yeah, we, you know, we we bathe in the same water. We we uh, they just had such a different mindset around conservation. And then you go next door, and it's like a fourteen hundred dollar electric bill, and it's like, what are you doing in there? This is crazy. How do you even? How can you afford to live this way? And I'm sure it's. I mean, to some people, I guess what I'm getting at, like money isn't as big of a deal, and as it is to other people, it's kind of like big corporations taking a loss as, you know, okay, we're going to have to pay this fee to deal with this EPA regulation that's coming out. We can take that hit. Other companies, they can't afford to take that hit, but also maybe they ethically, they didn't want to do something that would pollute the environment. Uh, acceptable casualties. Yeah. Acceptable losses. Where's the offset? Is this an acceptable loss? You know, and my Daryl likes to say this all the time. He's like, if you're chasing the money, you're in it for the wrong reason. That's true. For us, what we're doing is to help make sure that our token continues to hold value is that any projects we fund, we're not asking for the money back. We're not, some of them are joint ventures, some of them aren't, but what we're doing is they're signing a contractual agreement that they will use the application and use the tokens in exchange for the funding, in exchange for the partnership. So what we end up having is we have a guarantee from our partners saying, yes, we're going to use your token. So there's always going to be a natural, not a fictitious demand, but a natural, not emotionally based, but a driven by business based demand for the token. And that's how really we're making sure that value stays, because the bigger our partners grow, the more tokens they're going to need to use in their ecosystems. Yeah. And this, uh, you know, it seems like a perfect project for um, not only our country, but every country. So I'm, I'm curious. Um, is this going to become maybe like an all-in-one solution for other countries? Or what, what do you guys think about that sort of approach? Yeah, you know, we, we, we focused a lot on, um, you know, here in the United States. But, you know, our, our strategic partner, CTS, and our whole team, you know, you, you, drop, you drop one of these to where you're processing the waste that is abundant in developing countries, for instance. You're talking about you add in water, you add in, you know, they have now a chance to produce electricity, fertilizer, grow some food, X, Y, Z. When you give them just the basic tools and resources and show them that the resourcefulness, that next level of resourcefulness now will give them the resources to sustain life, but go further. You brought life back into their eyes. You know, there, there's a, you know, a mutual contact of ours. You know, he grew up in Vietnam. He, when he told me a story about how he was, you know, just, just a five years old and just playing in the water of the Mekong Delta and there's oil residue, there's all this toxic waste, there's, you know, all the, all the feet, like you think God knows what else is in there. And then when he went back, that's where he got the inspiration that we need to focus more on this. And when I hear a conversation like that, I'm like, why aren't we We're one of the wealthiest countries here? You know, like we can go out, you're in LA, we're here in Houston, energy capital of the world. And you think about it, like we have all of this, but there's only 300 million of us that are here compared to the rest of the world. You drop one of these there, you're talking about countries. Imagine like how, where, where, how, how, how much and how big their mind expands and evolves. And Dubai, you know, we just got done, you know, presenting Envision at the Blockchain Congress. And they're already moving towards green energy. You know, we hear about their big solar farm that they have, but you take a look at this now, you could take it up that next level. Singapore, same thing. And let alone take a look at India, for instance. Green energy. Yeah. Wow. But you're right, though, it's for every country. From trash to treasure, you know, you say one man's treasure is another man's treasure. We're going from trash to treasure now. Yeah. And our partners, one of the reasons they spoke at the UN and was invited to speak is because their aspiration is by next year, they have currently three contracts with municipalities talking with more um, here in the US, but they want 100 municipalities to sign up for these projects, this going to a zero waste type economy and a zero waste type circular economy locally, citywide, statewide, countywide, it doesn't really matter on any level. And so that's their goal. And they're looking international. They're not holding it to only one place. They're looking wherever people's lives would be improved on where to put these things. And you mentioned uh, speaking at 
the UN in addition to Dubai. Have you guys been to any other countries? And I guess, um, have you seen other blockchain initiatives that, that's trying to address what Envision is doing? Or are you guys, I mean, I haven't, I have not really, to be honest with you. And it, it seems like so much of, um, you know, like Africa is become is coming online nowadays. And, and uh, we've spoken to someone who works in Dubai before, and it's, it, it's so much booming sectors around the world. Maybe give us kind of more of a, a global, a little bit of a, a wider perspective, if you would. I look at it from like this, that, you know, you, you, t- you talked about that. You take a look at acceptable losses and we're in the United States people. We're third throwaway society. You know, that's majority, at least from what I've seen personally. And I look at developing countries, take just the continent of Africa, just as a prime example. When we, unfortunately, I can't travel my passport wasn't wasn't in um, it wasn't valid and for my partner we have to have six months to travel but when our team was already over there and able to actually present and people were lining up one meeting got turned into three which eventually started going into you know then 15 and then beyond and now i'm hearing that right now as i'm looking at my phone i got other messages of other emails that are gonna conflict with other schedule uh, on, uh, on other parts of my schedule and All of them right now are based either in the Middle East or on down to Northern and the Sahara and Africa. And it's because they want this, you know, when, 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 you know, they say the buck stops here and it's like, when people have enough is enough mentality, you're talking about people have had nothing, but then they see something. The only reason why, you know, and we talk about what, what is it really going to take to move this forward? What's it going to take to really focus on being environmentally friendly? It's called defining moments. And I've had multiple ones in my whole life, Russ also, and I'm sure you have also as well, Ethan, is that defining moments is what will change a person. But that's also, you put enough people to have a defining moment, it'll change a whole society. That's happening right now as we speak, as you see more people in Africa talk about how either they're going to implement blockchain here, they're speaking more at blockchain conferences. I know that there's one coming up in the Philippines. Uh, there's, a, there's one coming up in Houston that I just got notice of. And Also, another one for next year, or actually this coming December in Dubai again, because they're focusing more on the environmental aspect and how it moves forward there, not just on monetary gain, because if it's just about money, it's another me too. It's, um, you know, comfort, you know, the, 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 the weeds can kill your garden. I always heard that from a mentor. And sometimes like doing the same thing over, comfort kills. If you look around the world, Dubai is a big one because we were just there. We know that they have an initiative in the next few years to be 50% of all transactions are recorded on the blockchain. And then by 2050, they're looking to be 100% green energy. Now, if you look at places like China, China is full on embracing the digital currency aspect and moving towards the blockchain and modernization. Here in the U.S., people say they're not, but places like Chase and big corporations are still looking into it in the back end because it is a technology that is being underutilized and being scrutinized because of too many bad players. That's why we're very transparent. We're very all about transparency. You know, we're guaranteeing the live feeds. We're going to be posting our contracts, everything online so people can see. And more people need to be like that and hold that transparent. But around the world, people are starting to say, okay, this isn't just some fake money on the internet. There's actually technology behind it. Yeah, man. I really like where this is going. And um, you know, I'm grateful that you guys could be on the, the podcast today. And I, I think that it'd be really good for uh, any listener who would like to get involved. Uh, maybe maybe um, give them a little information about the tokens, um, where they can go to to purchase them and, and how the, all that works. So you can uh, find out more information about the project at nvzntoken.com. Uh, follow us on social media, Instagram, Facebook at nvzn underscore token or at nvzn official. Uh, for Twitter, uh, you can follow myself at NBZN CEO. Now to purchase, you can either go on to Vindex.com. Uh, uh, we have not started that round yet, but that round will, that 24-hour round will begin on October 29th at about 7 a.m. Central Standard Time, U.S. Canada, uh, 24 hours. So not sure where everyone is, but um, I would say register, complete all the information that you need to complete, and then. Just be ready to set your alarms. But thank you for having us.
Yeah, my pleasure. I think um, people get into the cryptocurrency, I don't know what to call it, movement really, to maybe their introduction was Bitcoin or gambling or, you know, trying to make money. But for me, it's, it really got me interested was the use cases and how it's going to revolutionize or upset traditional legacy systems. And this is something that I'm really, I'm impressed by. I think that it's, it's such a good use case of cryptocurrencies and uh, blockchain technology. Even though this is a, a very useful token, um, do you think that this is a modality for investors and the like that, that may attract them? Or, or is this mainly kind of like philanthropists and people who are trying to make kind of change for, uh, for the planet who are getting involved at this point? I see both, honestly. You know, in reality, though, as far as like, uh, you know, from an investor standpoint, the investors that I've spoken with, they've all literally, obviously, money, you know, I want, I want my money. But the other thing, too, is that when you look at even philanthropy, nonprofits, there's still money that has to come in. Money to me has been, and Russ mentioned it briefly, but when I say you come in because of the money and you leave because of the money, this is the problem though. If you make your life about that aspect day in, day out, that's a really, really, really bad thing because money, I've, I, I don't know if you've ever read the book. Um, so, you know, so I've been talking about it so much, but Start With Why by Simon Sinek. That book talks so much about what what you're buying into or what what people will buy into you know why are you doing it is really what you should focus on and what this is going to do you you look we look at the environmental aspect but it's going to get people to focus when they see a country that goes from nothing to then all of a sudden boom it, think about where dubai was in the 90s you know i was a baby but i know russ can maybe talk more about you know what it looked like but as of right now, when you see it in like Fast and Furious or, you know, like, uh, like I saw Mission Possible Ghost Protocol and you see like, whoa, this place is awesome. As far as like the, the, the incentives, you're, ta you're talking about even governments have already bought in and they already know what, where it's the revenue coming in, but also revenue coming out. When you got that, when you got that double stream. That's huge for an investor, <laughs> but it's more also too, it brings clarity that, hey, these, the, these waste byproducts can actually be used for something, which was really, I think, this universe really intended. As Daryl briefly mentioned, to traditional investors, you know, that's part of the joint ventures that we're getting as a company. That's one of the biggest things. You know, Daryl just mentioned in and out uh, income streams. And that's truly what's going on because the waste, you get paid to take the waste, and then we're pr producing byproducts that people can use down the road. So you get paid for the people to take those byproducts. Um, that's through our partners' technology. And that's one of the great things that will attract investors to make sure that this project goes on, right? This year, we got four projects we're looking to fund. I want this to be 400 in the next few years. You know, we don't want to just stop, okay, we, we changed the world with this technology once, and that's it. We're a one-shot pony. No, the continue to fund the projects as we make more money just because that'll help the world. Absolutely. You guys have really just answered all of my questions uh, brilliantly. I think probably the best thing I could offer the audience at this point is just, you know, give you guys the floor to leave us with anything you'd like to tell us about that we haven't already covered. Give us a little bit of, of your vision for the future. Honestly, I really do see that blockchain in the next, once this year closes, you know, Russ talked about this being a reset year. Back in December 2019, and I keep talking about that date so much, but it's just been I remember the day when I said this technology is going to increase in demand in ways that people never thought. And it's going to come through blessings in disguise. I know that everyone right now, probably your life got disrupted. Maybe some have, may, maybe, you know, things maybe haven't changed much. But to everyone here, we've all had that question of honesty, transparency, clarity. Is this right? Is this wrong? Good, bad, evil, whatever you, however you want to define the way I see blockchain is supercharging the speed and expediting when it comes to, if I want to know an answer, I can go find it. If I want to know, is this really being done right? I can go find it. If I want to know that the transaction or did I get what I actually deserved, the blockchain is what will actually solve the problem. Because when you put an organic check and balance system, not a manipulated checks and balances system, you, 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 you remove, like we, Russ talked about, human error. 
Human error, unfortunately, we're human beings. We deal with emotions every day. That's just who we are. We are not computers. However, though, with the DeFi, with the actual core of what DeFi represents, when you take out that human error, you take out human emotions, that's where that clarity is that is there. And it brings some maturity actually back to technology. It'll bring back some maturity to corporations. And also, you're talking about forcing people. Now, remember when things were, you know, a monopoly? I'm not sure if you remember, there wasn't as many corporations in one industry. But then when competition starts to rise, that's where now you have, okay, we got to concentrate on actually doing things right. Now we're going that next level with blockchain because not everybody's involved. And this is, you're, you're talking about a different world after 2020. Yeah, Russ, you, would you like to leave us with anything? Yeah, I would. Um, at the end of the day, Envision is about an application. We're building an application. But what we're envisioning is, because it doesn't take that much money, as I mentioned, to build it, is what we're going to do is we're going to focus 90% of everything that people want to throw behind us, want to get involved with, all to these projects. And... We'll bond the projects to make sure we protect the investment. We'll show the projects everything that we can show legally to everybody all the time. And if you want to know more, check us out more. And if you think anything, just try to find somebody else who's doing anything close to that. Try to take a look at all the projects that popped up and just disappeared ghost by night. They didn't post much. They didn't want anybody to know what they were doing, you know. And that's not the way to do business these days. Everything is instantaneous, instant gratification, instant information. If you want to do something good, believe in it and just be transparent about it. And if the world was more like that, I think we'd all be better off. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Well, gentlemen, this has been a really good podcast. Uh, I want to thank you, Daryl and Russ, for coming on and, and enlightening our audience. I encourage anyone listening who'd uh, like to get involved, uh, you know, envisiontoken.com, N-V-Z-N-T-O-K-E-N.com. Yeah, guys, I just want to say thanks again. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.